a kicking efficiency that we all see wherever we are and what have you. No, no, no. That's that's not the best measure to actually truly tell us who are the best and worst kicks in the competition. Disposal efficiency isn't an efficient measurement of effective disposals and even Daniel Hoyne agrees. Champion data was established in 1995 by former Carlton player Ted Hopkins and since 1999 they've been the official data partner of the AFL. Prior to the turn of the century, the only stats that were tracked rigorously were disposals, goals and behinds. So when Hopkins came in, he got to define many of the terms that we still use today. And a decision he made back in those days is the reason why we still measure effective disposals incorrectly. The mistake he makes goes back to the days where a long kick down the line to a 50-50 contest was considered good ball movement. So let's get into it. My name's Woody, this is Wooden Spoon Data with the 18th best AFL content on YouTube and give us a like and a sub so you don't miss out on any future videos. Disposal efficiency. Definition, percentage of disposals that are effective. So what defines an effective disposal? Effective handballs are defined as a handball to a teammate that hits the intended target. Well, what about effective kicks? Effective short kicks are defined as a kick of less than 40 metres that results in the intended target retaining possession. So what about long kicks? Well, this is where I think it gets most interesting. Champion data defines an effective long kick as a kick of more than 40 metres to a 50-50 contest or better for the team. And this is where myself and others believe the main problem lies. I'll use this moment to illustrate the problem. Round three, St Kilda versus Richmond at Marvel Stadium. 25 seconds into the third quarter, just before St Kilda began their run to win by 83. Sorry, I'm a Saints man. Sometimes you have to soak in the good moments. Anyway, Garcia gets the ball on the overlap from Wood and kicks it long inside 50 for a turnover. Now, some of you might be thinking, so what? That happens all the time. And yes, I agree. But it was also counted as both a turnover and an effective kick because the onus on effective long kicks isn't always to retain the football and therefore can include turnovers. This flows on and means all effective disposals can include turnovers too. So now we understand why disposal efficiency isn't a great measurement of a player's accuracy in modern football. What should we be using? Well, I'm not the first to point this problem out. I was reading an article a little while back called How Defining What Makes a Good Kick in the AFL is Always Up for Debate by Cody Atkinson and Sean Lawson of the ABC. And that's where I first read about Liam Crowhurst and his threat rating and retention rating metrics. Liam's come up with a brilliant way to judge a player's effectiveness with ball. He does this by looking at a player's starting location, target location, the type of kick, i.e. general play, marks, free kicks, etc. With that, he can measure how often a player's kick results in a shot at goal later in the chain against the expected average, and how likely the next player in the chain is to retain that kick compared to the expected average too. But I've simplified that a little bit, maybe even complicated it. So why don't we hear what Liam has to say himself? How are you doing today, Liam? Doing fantastic, thank you. Good to hear. So how did you come up with this idea? Yeah, I was getting really... Uh annoyed with uh, disposal efficiency and kicking efficiency as a statistic because it's very, it's an archaic definition of something from a bygone era. Um, kicks that go for, kicks that go 39 metres to a contest are classed as ineffective, but kicks that go 41 metres to a contest are classed as effective. And that didn't really sit right with me as a statistician and data scientist. I wanted to really create a new metric that was more representative of modern Australian rules football. And by doing this, I looked at the outcomes of kicks um, using this data set called the chain data set. And you can see every single kick, you can have its location, its implied pressure, how far they kicked it and at what angle. And from there, you can determine the average rate of retention for every single kick over the last five years. And you can compare players to see how well they do against the AFL average. Um, and then threat is another one. How likely is this kick to generate a scoring opportunity later down the chain? Um, so the two kind of ideas, retention and then threat as kind of like two advanced metrics. Thanks, Liam. That was much better than my explanation. I've got some more questions for you in a minute, but I want to touch on some other things just quickly. 
One of the main things that stood out to me in that article was that kicks over 40 meters are deemed 66% effective, whereas it appears that they are only retained about 44% of the time. We also got to see some examples of the least and most threatening kicks, which led me to thinking about a paper published by Darren O'Shaughnessy in 2006 called Possession versus Position, where he introduced the concept of field equity. The abstract states that coaches would like to quantify the trade-offs between contested play in good positions and uncontested play in less promising positions in order to inform their decision-making about where to put their players and when to gamble on sending a ball to a contest rather than simply maintaining possession. Darren did this by following each chain of play through to the next score using the on-ground location of 350,000 possessions and stoppages which sounds very similar to what Liam has done. And if we overlay Liam's work with Darren's set plays, i.e. marks and free kicks, and then his directed map, i.e. general play, there does seem to be some similarities, mostly being that the further the ball is up the ground, the more likely it is to lead to a score. In his results section, O'Shaughnessy presents a scenario. Imagine a player who has taken a mark 70 meters out from goal on a 45 degree angle. It is unlikely he can score himself, so he faces the unenviable task of bombing it long in hopes of improved field position without turning the ball over. The data used is old now, but back then he suggested that on average, a team in this position can expect to convert about two points which was perhaps an early foray into expected score in the AFL, though coaches are still discussing the most threatening area to attack from today. There has been much said about the depth of the AFL media landscape this year, but one of my favorite shows has been Simo and Horse's analysis on AFL 360. Here, Horse presents the launch pad, which is where teams are most effective at launching a score inside 50. And a term I'm sure we've all heard before, the hotspot, which O'Shaughnessy identified in his set play advantage map from 2006. To me, this suggests that champion data has had access to this for a while, and we, the public, are just starting to scratch the surface. But Liam, after everything you've learned, do you think it's better to take more threatening attacking options that might have a lower retention, or retain the ball as much as possible and work up the ground more methodically? It's, it is a balancing act. I think it comes down to uh, the, uh, a certain team style that a coach is trying to implement, whether you're a control winning team or you're a team that tries to get the ball forward as often as possible. What I've, what I've seen is that um, you generally only go long if you're entirely on, on the wings or on the sidelines or you're getting it into the hotspot because you're maybe 60 to 70 metres out and you don't have the journey. Um, I'd say possession is nine tenths of the game of AFL. Like if you just retain the ball, your likelihood of scoring next goes goes from maybe a 50-50 if it's in contest up to nearly 60 to 70% if you're just retaining it. Um, but then also having um, not only retaining it, but also retaining it in areas that you can then exploit. So kicking into the corridor and having good kicks into the corridor that are able to be retained, they are much more important than kicking it down the line to a 50-50 that allows it to be nullified 70% of the time. You'd rather have the retention. Liam, you mentioned passing to areas your team can exploit. It might just be my bias, but I've always thought that the slow kick into the pocket was one of the least threatening and most exploitable passes in footy as it closes off your angles out of defense. But I wanted to ask you a question about ball location and movement. From your research, are there low retention places on the ground or even plays that get used too often? And likewise, are there high percentage places or plays that don't get used enough? Probably the worst the worst one for me is like a, a handball received. Uh, so someone's got the mark on the defensive 50 and gives it to a running player um, in, in the transition moments, like this might be an intercept. And then that player bombs the ball 50 metres where most teams now have a defensive setup to have that plus one number behind the ball anyway. And for that, for me, I absolutely hate it when I see a quick transitional play that just ends up with a 50 meter kick to a contest like you totally kill the momentum it's interesting you bring up uh, about kick-ins because 
Most teams nowadays will run the ball out of the square, they'll take a bounce, and they've already gained 30 metres before they even kick it. And then they kick it 50 metres, which is, I, I think, is pretty good. Um, you're gaining so much more territory and you're able to reset at a stoppage and you still have numbers behind the ball in case you do turn it over. But what does it mean? It really comes down to if you can get the ball to your teammates at an advantage um, and whether that's opening up the angles of the 45 degrees to shift the defence and force the defence to commit to one side of the ground or to a certain player and that allows you to get the overlap potentially on the other side, the same side, maybe a chip over the top. But that 45 degree kick is something that is incredibly powerful. Yeah, it's funny. The public still judges players on disposal efficiency. And it seems like the 45 degree pass phrase that we've heard forever. And many of the AFL's classic terms are born from the information that came out of Darren O'Shaughnessy in 2006. So Liam, if we know disposal efficiency is wrong, is there anything better we can look at? The, the best metric that I can think of that relates something similar to this is called kick rating, which champion data don't give out freely either. You might see it pop up on a three, AFL 360, you know, they might pop up, oh, this player has good kick rating, which is similar, but it doesn't take into account the implied pressure on the kick. You know, it takes into account the locations, <clears throat> which is annoying. Whereas my model, I use an XG boosted um, random forest model, and I try to imply from how the person received the ball, what kind of pressure they were under. If it's a loose ball get or a hard ball get, those are, those are like contested possessions, and then you have uncontested from handball receives, and then you have the set plays from marks and free kicks. Um, and being able to differentiate those those kind of three uh, possession types allows you to get far greater granularity on the difficulty of the kick. Um, in, in terms of a stat that is good from the AFL, like the AFL player ratings takes into account positional stuff quite quite a bit but that's more broad that doesn't just look at kicks that looks at handballs intercepts and goal kicking um yeah it's it's a real shame that champion data don't give us anything more advanced than account statistic for stats we've had since the you know 1800s yeah it's annoying <laughs> Yeah, mate, it's one of the reasons I got into this. I do think score involvement percentage is useful to gauge a forward's output and disposals per turnover is probably what I consider to be the most important usage stat for defenders. Yeah, yeah. So another stat that I like is that some people now uh, have kind of figured out is from like defensive half turnovers and whether you can convert that to a... Uh, a goal like some some sometimes on the AFL broadcast they might have um, you know uh, scores from turnover chains um, and sometimes they'll split that by defensive half versus forward half and you can really see teams that are able to transition the ball quickly or you know safely into a good scoring areas um, so maybe that's a start to look out for as well. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I probably should mention that those stats and the retention and threat ratings that we've been discussing in this video are up on Wheelo ratings for everybody to play with themselves. Link will be in description below. But before they go and do that, Liam, you've had a good look through this information. Who do you think has the most threatening kick while still having a high retention? For me, that ticks both the boxes is Noah Anderson for the uh, Gold Coast Suns. He's just one of the most yeah, uh, incredible mids that I that I've seen. Um, uh, his ability to take on incredibly threatening kicks, like all of his kicks are going to be forward half and inside fifties, and he is just able to find the targets up front that allows him to convert that into a into a good scoring shot. Then um, that reflects better on it. Um, other players that do really well are Max Holmes. Um, Jacob Weedering is a great kick as well. Um, Mitchell Hinge has been doing pretty good this year. And Pat Lipinski, I'd say, has had a real standout start to the season. He's, he's been incredibly good as well. Cheers, Liam. I've already had a bit of a play with it, as I'm sure many are about to do. But before they go, where can they find more things from you in the future? 
Yeah, if you want to see a lot of my content and ramblings about Australian football content, uh, Twitter is probably the best place to do it. I'm at CrowDataSci, S-I-G-H, because my old account, CrowDataSci, S-C-I, got nuked uh, a couple of years ago, so I'm a bit annoyed. But I'm also there on uh, useless AFL stats on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Awesome, we'll be sure to link that below too. That's about it, my name's Woody, this is Wooden Spoon Data with the 18th best AFL content on YouTube. If you like this video and you wanna see more data focused AFL content, click the subscribe button and the notification bell to be kept up to date. YouTube also suggests some videos you might like here, so if you're interested, go have a look. Thanks again, see you soon. I've been working on this poem for 12 years. Really? There's a lot of expectation. I don't want to disappoint my fans. May I?